I love you, Edith. What? To me, you're like a sister. Oh, Beverly. Mm. To me, you're like a sister. Uh, no, I mean brother. Oh, well, <laughs> both rolled into one. <laughs> In the last Culture Cruise video, I talked about how the show All in the Family introduced Beverly LaSalle, presenting a female impersonator as being worthy of love and respect at a time when TV tended to depict queer people as mere punchlines. But Beverly was also one of the first queer characters on television to come back for more than one episode, growing closer to the bunkers over the course of years until her storyline took a dark turn. All aboard and welcome to Matt Baum's Culture Cruise. Last month we talked about the time that Archie Bunker saved Beverly LaSalle's life with some mouth to mouth, and then she saved his reputation with some quick thinking in a bar. Now it's time to talk about how her later appearances broke new ground, both good and bad. Thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with the pledge of support on Patreon. If you're enjoying these videos, head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum or click the link in the description to check out the rewards for backers, like early ad-free access to videos, a care package in the mail, and even a temporary Culture Cruise tattoo. Beverly LaSalle first appeared as a plucky female impersonator in the episode Archie the Hero in 1975. If you missed that Culture Cruise, there's a link in the description. She returns a year later in 1976 in the episode Beverly Rides Again. It starts down at the corner bar with some of the guys pulling a series of practical jokes on Archie. He gets annoyed at them and storms home to plot his revenge, but there's a surprise waiting from there as well. Look who's back. You're the lady, Archie. Say, but you turned out to be a man. A queer character who actually comes back for more than one episode? It's a TV miracle. At the time, most TV shows depicted gay people as either non-existent or so vanishingly rare you might never even meet one. The same year this episode aired, the TV show called Family had a gay character on a single episode, and everyone talked about him like they just discovered a mutant. Tug, I think of myself as a fairly sophisticated woman. You've never been touched by anything like this personally. It's something I've almost never thought about. The guy they're talking about on Family appears in the show once, promises to keep in touch, and then is never mentioned again. In contrast, Beverly has just become a recurring part of the Bunkers' lives. Now that she's returned, the family can develop a more personal relationship with her, get used to her, become comfortable around her, and so can the audience. But Archie is not ready to become comfortable around her just yet. He's still fixated on the guys down at the bar and plotting some form of practical joke revenge, and that's when he gets a terrible, grinchy idea. He decides to set his friend Pinky up with Beverly on a dinner date as a practical joke. Oh, well, all right, let me run back to the motel and change things. Oh, wait, 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 change what? I'll get into a suit and tie. No, no, don't do that. Stay just the way you are. You look gorgeous that way. Well, Mr. Bunker, I've never been to dinner in a dress in my life. Archie's prank is met with unanimous disapproval. Edith thinks it's too mean, and Beverly is simply scandalized. Not an easy thing to do to a drag queen. This is also quite a departure from the way that cross-dressing was normally depicted in the media at the time, which was often as a means to deceive others. I talked about this more in the previous video, but cross-dressers, on those rare occasions when they did appear on screen, were often shown trying to trick someone, like on Bosom Buddies or Three's Company, or dating all the way back to the silent era. But Beverly actively subverts that trope. Mr. Bunker, this is deceiving a total stranger. I can't go along Aww. with that. But Archie insists, and Beverly does owe him her life, so she reluctantly agrees. When Pinky comes over, there's some awkward flirting, and then when Archie and Edith go upstairs to change... So, you're Beverly LaSalle from out of town, huh? Is that your real name or your stage name? Turns out, Pinky recognizes Beverly from her posters. But he's not mad. He thinks that the whole situation's funny. He wants to go along with it, he says, and let Archie think Pinky's fooled because he wants his friend to feel the satisfaction of thinking he's pulled off a prank. This is starting to get complicated, but don't worry, just go with it. I love that guy. He's like a brother to me. I really love him. It'll make him happy. Well, all right, I owe it to him, I guess. If you're sure it'll really make him happy, okay. The show goes out of its way again here to show that Beverly doesn't like fooling people. She's not trying to pose as someone she's not, she's just trying to do a favor for a friend. That's a huge departure from the trope of the deceitful transvestite. Beverly's one of the only people in this whole episode who doesn't want there to be any misunderstanding about who she is. So off they go to an extremely 70s Chinese restaurant. The date's going okay. I always like guys with little meat in their bones. <laughs> From a Girona, you find a lot more. <laughs> But Pinky's coming on real strong, and Beverly looks super uncomfortable. Edith insists that Archie come clean, so... All right, Edith, yeah, all right, it's a joke. That's right, Pinky, it's a joke, and a joke is on you for a change, and a hell of a joke it is. You mean that Beverly's a guy? Beverly... <laughs> In an episode full of twists and turns, now we've got one more. 
Pinky was lying to Beverly. He actually wanted to bide his time and then ruin the prank so he could make Archie feel dumb for failing to pull it off. Oh boy, heterosexuals are exhausting. Anyway, Pinky gloats about Archie's failed practical joke, but then there's one more twist. Turns out, Archie had secretly called Pinky's girlfriend Doris and told her to come catch him with Beverly. And that's the real prank Archie was pulling. With her arrival, Beverly takes the opportunity for a wig reveal. Showtime! And then Pinky's humiliated and runs out with Doris in angry pursuit. Archie is beside himself with his victory and with gratitude. This is one of the greatest nights of my life! I finally got even with that guy! I gotta thank you two swell girls! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have to admit, The Kiss is a legitimately funny twist that I did not see coming. Archie starts off uncomfortable around Beverly at first, but that wanes over the course of the episode until he finds himself thinking of Beverly not as some threat to his masculinity, but as he says, a swell girl. For just a moment there at the end, his pride overrules his prejudice just long enough for him to land a kiss. It's actually kind of sweet. And with all the practical joking that goes on in this episode, I think it's a big deal that one of the only people who isn't trying to fool anyone is Beverly. The show makes it quite clear that she doesn't want to be deceptive, that it's the straight men who are trying to use her to trick each other. I'm glad you know. Now we can go out to dinner and have a good time, and I can go back to the motel and change. No, 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 no. That really plays against what audiences expected from female impersonator characters at the time, giving Beverly a lot more nuance than she would have had if they just used her as an easy joke. Not to mention, her return in this episode gives the Bunkers, and the audience, an opportunity to develop a more personal connection with her, now that she's a recurring element of their lives. That deeper connection will become very important in her next appearance, a year later, in a two-parter called Edith's Crisis of Faith. This is a heavy one, so buckle up. Beverly is once again back at the Bunker home, celebrating Christmas and her upcoming show at Carnegie Hall. They all seem to have grown a lot closer over the past year. Look at how tender this scene with Edith is. I saved all your reviews from all over the country. Aren't you nice? <laughs> Well, we're just proud of you. I mean, there have been celebrities in this house. Sammy Davis Jr. and Lena Fleischhacker, whose niece did a TV commercial for Bad Breath. <laughs> You're the only one that's like family. Wow, there's something in my eye, and that something is that I'm crying. Family isn't something that every queer person gets to have, especially a drag queen in 1977. A year earlier, that episode of the show Family showed a gay man coming out to his father, and it went like this. Dad? Do you want me to leave too? I don't care what you do. Queer people still, 40 years later, face exactly that kind of rejection from family, and worse. Imagine what it must have meant for queer viewers to see someone like Beverly receive unconditional acceptance from someone like Edith. That's a very precious thing, and Beverly understands how lucky she is. I love you, Edith. What? To me, you're like a sister. Oh, Beverly. Mm. To me, you're like a sister. Uh, no, I mean brother. Oh, well, <laughs> both rolled into one. <laughs> okay, two years later, you still haven't worked out the pronouns. Whatever. Edith wants Beverly to come to Christmas dinner, and while Archie's a little dismayed about that, Edith's firm. We're all God's children. God loves everybody, including Beverly, and he don't want nobody to be alone on Christmas. Besides, I already invited him. Remember that line, God loves everyone. Just like the first episode where Beverly appeared, Edith's faith guides her to think of Beverly as a person like anyone else, worthy of love and respect particularly on a holiday that's founded on taking in those who couldn't find shelter anywhere else. The Bunkers have a truly lovely moment with everyone gathered together, happily enjoying each other's company, making it clear that Beverly's a part of their family. But it's not gonna last. As the hour gets late, Beverly and Mike walk to the corner to catch a cab. And just a few minutes later, the family hears sirens and rushes outside. It's a chilling scene. <laughs> Beverly and Mike were attacked by muggers just steps from the bunker home. In the hospital, Mike explains what happened. Beverly tackled him. He saved my life. But then two of them just, uh, they started just beating on Beverly. I guess they figured out what he was and they just started smashing him with the pipe. I, I, I don't want to hear anymore. And there's worse news about Beverly awaiting the family outside. This is an incredible scene. Listen to the audience reaction and watch Edith's face. Oh, uh, you ain't telling us that he's uh, 
I'm sorry he just died. Can you imagine a sitcom today having such a long stretch of silence? The family's stunned, and the next scene shows them all experiencing grief in various ways. Archie, trying to maintain some spirit of Christmas, has some sincerely nice things to say. I wish I had a told Beverly what a nice fella she was. You know? <laughs> but Edith is completely devastated. She can't make sense of the tragedy, and then Gloria says something that inadvertently makes it worse. Again, watch Edith's face. Oh. I can't understand it. I mean, everything was going so good for him, and then somebody had to kill him. Yeah, just because he was different. <laughs> just because he was different. But Edith never saw Beverly that way. Like she said, we're all God's children, so how different could Beverly really be? That throws Edith into a crisis about what God's love means. She leaves for church, but only gets as far as the porch. I ain't going to church. What's the matter, Ma? You always go to church on Sunday. Well, I ain't going today! Beverly's loss has changed something fundamental for Edith. Once more, watch how much the show is able to communicate with just a few looks and some long silences. I may not go to church ever. Well, now, Edith, you know, I hate to cross you in things like this here, but I really think that somebody from the family <laughs> ought to kind of be there representing us in front of God. Why? What good does it do? Oh, Ma. Ma? Hey, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> this was originally a two-part episode, with some stations airing both halves together, and others airing them a week apart. This is where the first half ends, and by the way, it aired a week before Christmas. So, happy holidays, everyone! Despite it being quite a downer, reaction to this episode was actually pretty positive. TV critics at the time called it very good, particularly effective, and ingenious. I searched news archives and couldn't find a single complaint or letter to the editor about it, except one that said that the resolution, which we'll get to, wasn't convincing. And personally, I disagree. Otherwise, everyone really seemed to like it. So now we're on to part two. It's Christmas Day, but Edith is feeling too sad to participate in the festivities. I don't feel like opening presents. I ain't in the mood to ooh and ah. Uncle Edith. <laughs> Family tries to cheer her up. Archie's heart's in the right place, but oh boy, his words are not. Maybe she's lucky that he lived as long as she did. <laughs> what? Well, you know what I mean? This, this is New York, and, and, and guys like Beverly, uh, I mean, they're either getting mugged by strangers or they're getting murdered by close friends. <laughs> You see it in the paper every day. I mean, in New York, the uh, fags is, uh, I mean, yeah, thanks. That's, a, that's what you call an ungendered species. Okay, that's enough of that. To Archie, this is part of some abstract problem that happens all the time to guys like Beverly. And he's not wrong that queer people were often the victims of violent crime in the 70s, for that matter, still to this day. Just a few months after this episode aired, a gang of teenagers armed with baseball bats targeted gay men for beatings in Central Park. But Edith isn't thinking about guys like Beverly. She's only thinking about Beverly. To her, this is a tragedy about a single person she cared about. Homophobia was a systemic, society-wide problem, but Edith's experiencing it through her personal connection with one particular victim. Her reaction is not only normal and compassionate, but puts a human face on a tragedy that otherwise might have seemed abstract, far away, somebody else's problem. What's happening with Edith, understanding the plight of a marginalized group through a personal connection to one member of that group, is actually a pretty common phenomenon. Personal connections often help people understand larger issues in ways they didn't before, spurring them to take action. A real-life example? Just one month before this episode aired, Harvey Milk was elected supervisor in San Francisco. By that time, Harvey had become an integral part of the community. People knew him not only as an icon of queer empowerment, but on a personal level, for years, as a neighbor and a friend. That personal connection helped get him elected, thanks to volunteer work of folks who'd come to know and respect him. 
and it also led to the mourning and rage when he was killed a year later. In the months following Harvey's murder in 1978, San Francisco experienced waves of grief, with multiple vigils in his memory. And when his killer, Dan White, got the lightest possible sentence, that grief turned to action and anger. Protesters stormed City Hall when the sentence came down, furious that Harvey had been denied justice. San Francisco police had raised $100,000 for Dan White's defense, on top of frequent police harassment of queer people, and the community was fed up. That night, they set fire to police cars, tore down the ironwork around City Hall, smashed windows, and rioted. A group called the Fruit Punch Collective recorded audio of the scene, including a fiery speech by an organizer named Amber Hollibaugh. It's time we stood up for each other! That's what Harvey meant to us! He wasn't some big leader, he was one of us! I don't think it's wrong for us to feel like we do! I think we should feel like it more often! Following the White Knight riot, San Francisco instituted reforms in the police department, Mayor Dianne Feinstein appointed a bunch of queer people to public office, and Harvey's replacement, Harry Britt, got to work on the nation's first domestic partner legislation, which was vetoed by Feinstein and later signed by his successor. The city was galvanized to action in part because so many people had a personal connection to Harvey Milk, along with personal grief and fury when he was lost. I wasn't alive when the White Knight riots happened, but I was in San Francisco for the Prop 8 campaign in 2008, when that lesson about the power of personal connections had to be learned all over again. The TV ads telling people to vote no on Prop 8 were pretty impersonal. They were mostly about vague virtues that needed to be upheld. It's wrong to treat people differently under the law. No on 8. Unfair, unnecessary, and wrong. Those ads didn't work. Prop 8 passed, and California lost marriage equality for years, but organizers tried something different four years later, when a marriage measure was up for a vote in Maryland. I'm Reverend Allison Halsey, and I'm for it. For it. For it. For it. I'm for everybody getting their slice of the wedding cake. For my dad. For his partner, Tom. For my two moms. I'm for getting wedding presents instead of giving them all the time. The Prop 8 ads presented an abstract idea about the issue. The Maryland ads showed actual people affected, humanizing them. Both asked for the same thing, vote to support the freedom to marry, but the approach was totally different. And sure enough, Maryland voters approved marriage equality, something that had never happened before in the U.S. The personal connection is what helped marriage pass in Maryland. It's what changed San Francisco after Harvey was killed. It's what's going on with Edith, and more importantly, with the audience watching this episode. Viewers in the late 1970s may not have been ready to think about queer people on a personal level. They were probably more likely to have the same attitude as that sophisticated woman on the show Family, who'd never even thought about gays before. Remember how Archie described what happened? To him, violence against queer people was just something that happens to certain people. He's ready to rationalize it and move on. For that matter, Mike and Gloria don't even seem that broken up for very long either. But Edith's grief stops them from rationalizing, or from abstracting, or from forgetting that a hate crime against someone she loved happened just steps from their home. She's forcing them to stop and recognize what happened. But we also need to recognize one more way that this episode breaks new ground, and it's not so good. This episode relies on the trope of a queer person dying to advance the character development of a straight person. Often in TV and film, the death of a marginalized person is used to explore the feelings of a non-marginalized person. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's nice that Edith is so affected by Beverly's loss, but the episode makes it all about Edith, framing it as her tragedy rather than Beverly's. And that happens on TV a lot. A few years ago, Autostraddle did a survey of lesbian characters dating back to 1976 and found that since then, 31% were killed off, and just 11% had a happy ending. It's a trope that's commonly called bury your gays, and it can reduce queer lives to utility, presenting them as existing only to enrich the lives of straight people through tragedy. And don't get me wrong, I like this episode. I think it's beautifully written, and the acting is incredible. I love that through her appearances, Beverly humanized queer people, and that the show gave the audience a personal connection to her, showing her loss as a real tragedy, not just some statistic or abstract idea. But geez, it sure would be nice if that could happen without somebody's death. Ideally, folks would approach queer people as Edith does from the very beginning, presupposing their humanity rather than needing to have it proven to them by someone dying. 
Edith's grief seems like it's gonna last forever, but then Mike makes a breakthrough. He realizes that she's not just sad, she's angry. Ma, who are you mad at? I'm mad at God. Mike's an atheist. It's remarkable that he, out of everyone in the family, finds a way to comfort her. Trouble with me is I don't understand nothing. Ma, that's not true. You understand plenty. Ma, if there is a God, you're one of the most understanding people he ever made. We need you. Mike's right, we do need Edith. We need people who are understanding, who can see other people's value and dignity and place in the family. She may not understand God, but she's better than anyone else on the show at understanding the people around her. So she emerges for Christmas dinner and offers a prayer. I'm sorry that I can't understand everything all at once, but I am thankful for Mike and Gloria. <laughs> and, and Ian Iola. You forget somebody is. <laughs> and Sybil Gooley. Forget somebody is. Oh, and Archie. <laughs> about 18 million people watched the show when it aired. That's about as many as watched the series finale of Game of Thrones. And with any luck, viewers were changed for having grieved along with Edith, coming away with compassion for people who might have seemed like an abstract other before. It's just a bummer that along with one of the first positive depictions of a drag queen came one of the first queer characters killed to advance a straight character's plot. These days, the deceitful cross-dresser trope feels pretty dated and old-fashioned. Bury Your Gaze may be finally getting the same treatment, thanks in part to a large backlash in 2016 when queer characters were killed on The 100, The Magicians, Jane the Virgin, and The Walking Dead all in the span of a month. Four gays buried in such a short span of time was pretty frustrating, but fans didn't just grieve, they got mad. They organized petitions, boycotted shows, demanded explanations at conventions, and as a result, they were heard. Jason Rothenberg, the showrunner of The 100, apologized. At WonderCon, he told a room full of fans that he should have done better and would in the future. Producer Javier Grigio Markswatch said that it was a wake-up call to change how they depict queer deaths. Television's been burying its gaze for decades, but it's finally realizing now that queer characters can actually thrive. That change is happening thanks to fans forming personal connections with recurring queer characters, which is a process that started way back in the 70s, when Beverly LaSalle showed up on the bunker's porch to become the most unlikely member of the family. I've got more videos about how All in the Family broke new ground for queer characters on TV. Check out the links in the description for those. And let me know what shows you want me to talk about next at Matt Baum on Twitter and in the YouTube comments. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to gaze at some berries.